thanks for joining us. As you can see, people are filling in already. We've got an extraordinary time planned. We're preaching through the series. It's the story of David. It's the story of a young man who is forgotten, but he's chosen. It's the boy who become king. It's the shepherd who's a poet. It's exceptional. So thank you for joining us. Uh, click at the bottom, subscribe to our channel, and uh, we're trusting that God will have an influence in your life as he did with David. God bless you. We're in the series of David. One, sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 5. We read together. We'll have it on the screens. You get to make notes. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In past times, when, king, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall, you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron and King David and made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. In verse 9, David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the millow inward. David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. This is the young boy that was told when he was about 15 years old that one day you'll be king, anointed by Samuel. <laughs> he gets, it gets prophesied, you will, it's going to happen, it's going to take place. There's something that's going to shift in your life. He goes through chaos, he fights giants, he fights people, he kills thousands of men. He ends up having to strip 200 men of their foreskins just to prove a point and get his wife. This is wild, you can't make this stuff up. If it's a crazy story, it's probably in the Bible. It's incredible how God calls him and he goes through this crazy journey. <laughs> what on earth has it got to do with us? You see, what God said he's going to do, he's going to do. What God promised, he's going to do. When he spoke to the 15-year-old little Jewish kid who was looking after sheep and smelt funky because he wasn't washing regularly, when God said, king over my people, my people, the greatest natural king to ever live is housed in you, and I'm going to see it released. He wasn't joking. He wasn't lying. He took it very seriously. What God has spoken over your life, it doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in. It doesn't matter what situation you believe you're in. God, what he said he's going to do, he's going to do it. I'm going to pray. You'll believe. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Open our hearts and minds so that it'll become a reality to us that no matter where we find ourselves, you have a purpose and a calling over our lives as sons and daughters of the Most High King, that the promises that you've made us are true and you are faithful and you are just and you are loving and you are kind and the plans you have for us are good plans. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that by your power this morning, you'll speak into the depths of our hearts that will leave you changed, challenged and renewed. By your power, we pray, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a great fire that's coming to the world, the greatest revival we've ever seen. It'll be the greatest awakening that has ever taken place. Fourteen key prophets across the world have spoken this over our nation, that it's going to start in South Africa. It's going to start at the tip of Africa. They've seen on 14 different people on four different continents, saw the same picture over a 12-month period that this hand comes towards the map of Africa and it starts at the bottom and the fire of God touches Africa and it burns up and as it burns up, it burns across the world. It's the word spoken across this country. It's the word spoken ago over this nation. It's the word spoken over this church. It's the word spoken over the children of God. It's you and what God has said is going to happen is going to happen. And you go, well, I'm not adequate enough. I'm not trained enough. I don't even know if I want it. What God has called into being I'm going to preach well. You're going to listen well. What God is calling into being in this nation is as unlikely, what God has promised over us is as unlikely as what was promised over David. The chances of David being king, you must be joking. Stupid little kid, smallest in the family. So puny, his father forgot to bring him in when Samuel the prophet was looking to see who would be ordained, he's that insignificant. When the world looks at us, they go, South Africa, there's no purpose, there's no hope, there's nothing. 
Look how puny and significant that little ball at the bottom of Africa is. And God goes, I will choose the most unlikely, the most ridiculous, the one that won't work. And I will display my glory. Prophetic word that has been spoken from this pulpit, that has been, re- been spoken over this nation for 30 years, is this. South Africa is not a white creature with black and white stripes. South Africa is not a black creature with white and brown stripes. This country is made up of brown, white, and black people. And God is going to use us as a team to see this nation changed. But there there, there are four key statements in this text that I believe is a roadmap for us to pursue the destiny of the church. But it's a roadmap for you to pursue your destiny. Because each and every one of you, there's more to your life than what you just lived to this point. There's more to your existence than in getting up and getting dressed, or preferably showering or getting washed on some level beforehand, and getting ready and going to work and going to work and just not killing your boss. Except my stuff, because that's just heaven. And then going home, going to gym, trying to avoid carbohydrates, and going back to sleep. There's got to be more to this existence. Amen. It starts off with this. Behold, we are your bone and flesh. It's a declaration that the nation makes over David. And I believe this is something key. Your calling, your mission, your value will not be discovered with you isolated and separate from fellowship. Your calling and your mission is found within community. We've spoken about this for more than a month. This common unity, us together. Your calling, your ministry, your value, it's us together. It's us getting the job done, each one doing his own thing, not on his own, but together. Each one having a call and a purpose and a value. I'm going to say those words until you go, that includes me. Because there's something that God has placed in you, and therefore God has placed you in this church, so you can be who God's called you to be. And you don't have to be a preacher. We've got some. But you want to be a worship leader? You want to be on stage? This is where it takes place. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10. I love the message version because it's simple. And this is not a Bible study. This is a, me teaching you out of, something out of Scripture. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. So let's do it, full of belief, confident that we are presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promise that's keeping us going. <laughs> he always keeps his word. God always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Mm. It's going to happen in fellowship. It's going to happen in community. You cannot function out of this. The devil wants to see you offended, and he wants to see you shifted away. He wants to see you upset and pushed away. He wants to see you busy and just We'll do church once a month. We'll do life group every four months. But God says, I want to bring you into this community of believers so that you can serve out your purpose and your calling. Because not one of us, not one of us have it all together. But together, we have it all. That's the reality. Us together, everyone functioning. People go, oh, well, uh, I want to launch a CD. Well, then you take an elastic and you... Oh, I've got a greatest bro. I want to be a singer. Join the choir. How many of the guys in this room can sing? Can you? No, you don't. No, don't lie. No, I stand in front of you. No, I know you can't sing. Every time you stand behind me, I've got the guys adjusting the sound. <laughs> Now nobody wants to raise their hand, I get it. But what about if you go, well, I'm in. I can sing all right. That's what we're asking for this morning. If you can sing, okay. I'm not saying what these guys, if you can kind of hold a note, and by the grace of God, it doesn't sound like somebody's butchering a small animal in a box. If you can kind of do it. Then we've got a guy that has said in this church, if you can get them on stage, I'll teach them, lead them, and we'll make it great. That's what every ministry looks like. Oh, I don't know how to do something very well. We're all amateurs. We're all trying to figure this out. But there's place for you, but it takes place in community. Our flesh, our bone, one father, one body, the bride. Those are the illustrations Scripture uses. So why not do that? Ladies, if you, how many ladies can sing really well? Put your hands up. I promise you I won't say anything funny. So 
Now you can sit there and oh, oh, I didn't know I could hit that note either. I'm sorry. So I'll oh, join the choir. So, so you go, I'm going to get involved in the choir. And you come there, and if you're not great, there's going to be one mic that's unplugged. And we'll just have you stand there. But you get to serve and worship, and we get to do this all together. If you can stand on your hind legs, we need guys on security detail. Life happens together. And it's not done by everyone who knows what they're doing. It's just we serve and we love each other. By the way, good morning. If you're a visitor at Lighthouse Church, I have to have this disclaimer most of the times. Welcome. We need to be connected. We need to do this. Get into a life group. Oh, my life group's not great. It's probably your fault. Change. Anyway, we'll move on. They speak to David. They go, but you flesh and bone, we're part of the same family. Then they say to him, it is you who led out and brought in Israel. You did what we need you to do. If you're waiting to become a leader before you act like a leader, you'll never be a good leader. If you're waiting for a promotion at work before you start acting responsibly at work, you'll never get that promotion or you'll never keep that promotion. You need to live a life now that would sustain you in your new position. We need to develop better habits in our life. David never set out to be king. David set out to be a good leader. And Israel chose the good leader. Israel chose him because he led well. They could identify his gifting. Your call is not enough if you're not willing to work at character and habits. Let me, explain, let me put it this way. Um, we have a room in our home. It's my room. My stuff is there. I like stuff. But it's not as neat as the rest of my house because the rest of the house belongs to my wife. And there everything's in order and everything's neat and precise. You open the drawer, there's a place for the knives, the forks, the spoons, the teaspoons. The not, the, the, the not so very sharp knives and then my knives which are very sharp, they're there. It's order. When you go into my room, I have a whole lot of crates and I have stuff in there. And then ever so often, maybe once a month, I go, now I'm going to sort this out. It's going to be color-coded, alphabetized, numbered. It's going to be spectacular. And I'll take a whole Saturday to go and sort out. And you guys know what I'm talking about because you either have a Wendy house or a garage that's like that. And then it takes you a whole day. And I'm like a five-year-old cleaning out his Lego box. I'm in there for an hour. Heidi comes to bring me a refreshing drink because I must be working so hard. And I'm sitting in and I'm playing with something. She walks... I forgot I even had this. What is it? I don't know. But it's beautiful, and I'm going to put it back together. And then she will be amazing. And it takes me the whole day, and I sort out the place, and it's fantastic. Then what happens is that Monday, I walk into the house, I put something down, Hattie takes it, she opens that room's door, and she puts it down in there because it's my stuff. Then what happens after two months, I look at the room, and I go, well, it's not color-coded, alphabetized, and it's not numbered anymore. I need to take the whole day. Oh, I just don't have the flippant strength. We'll walk around the crate. We will open this crate. We'll function around it. Because I haven't established a habit of keeping the room tidy all the time, it creates this huge job for me every time I want to tackle it. So what I'm doing now is I'm rather developing a habit that instead of me putting whatever's in my pockets down on the little table, we have those magical tables, we walk in and we empty out things that we never knew we had, we put it down there. Instead of doing that, I take whatever's, and I go put it in the correct place. So I'm developing the habit of being neater, I'm not a messy person, but I have the room. So I'm, I'm neater, I'm practicing a habit so that eventually when this room is tidied again, it will stay tidy. We cannot wait for big events in our life before we change who we are. And I'm not talking about inner strength and summon the inner power. The only inner strength you have is the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. But there's stuff that you need to introduce into your life that allow you to be in ministry. If you want to be a leader, act like a leader now. Pray like a leader now. Pray like a person in authority now. Establish the habits. David didn't become king and then go... Okay, boys, how do I lead this thing? He developed habits in his life so that when he was made king, he had established a reputation and he had developed his ability. 
We all know those people. We have goals. New Year's resolutions. I'm sure some of you are starting to think, diet, smiet, two months left, we'll start in January. And then what happens is you go on diet, and I'm, I'm watching you laugh at me, and it's, because I know it's true. Or we're going to, I'm going to lose 20 kilos. So we go on this diet, and we, you know, you, you, it's, it's kale chips for breakfast, and, and, and then sun-dried beetroot for lunch, and then you're allowed to look at a piece of lean steak at night. Can't touch it. You can lick the box. So you do that um, for 12 weeks, because it's the 12-week challenge. And you do it for 12 weeks, and you, you lose your personality and your weight. And, and now you've done it. And everyone says, oh, you look so great, because your skin's hanging on you like a deflated suit. And you're feeling fantastic. You've got four hours of energy a week left in you. And then you go, I've reached my goal. My pants <clears throat> fit. And then you go back to your old habits. And then it's as if fat is demonic. I'm not saying it is, but it's like it is. Because it says in Scripture, when you clean the house, it leaves and wanders in dry places. It then comes back with seven of its friends <laughs> to see if the house is occupied. And that's what happens. <laughs> so it leaves. It makes friends. Somewhere there's fat getting together, becoming friends with other fat. And then you eat normally, and they all come back, and there's this glorious reunion, and it meets in the places you don't want it to be. Because the habits haven't changed. You had this goal. Re-establish godly habits in your life. We do this. I'm going to read through the whole Bible this year. Wonderful. First day, you miss a bit. Second day, you miss a bit. Third day, you're thinking, I've got to read Genesis and Exodus. Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, you go... Okay, I'm going to take this Saturday. I'm going to read Matthew, Mark, Luke. You don't do it. So you act like a failure and you think, next year. It never gets done. When you start developing habits in your life, if you're not a person that reads Scripture, from tomorrow, read a verse. Read one verse in Scripture. <laughs> Jesus had to develop habits. I'm going to show this to you in Luke chapter 5, verse 16. But Jesus himself would, <clears throat> excuse me, often... <clears throat> slip away to the wilderness and pray. <clears throat> Luke 22, and he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. You see, what he did often prepared him, what was his custom released him. I say this because when Jesus would go and pray, he was preparing himself for his death. He was preparing himself for the mission. But it's when he went as his custom to go to the garden and speak to his father, this is the moment where he's sweating blood. It's his custom. What he did often became his custom. His custom, which is what his habits are, released him into what God had called him to. Your habits will define your destiny every single time. Every single time. What you do every day is who you are. If you gossip every day, it's who you are. If you mock people every day, it's who you are. So, but I'm not that. You will become that. You'll turn into that person. Goals are great, vision's better, change your habits. So this is how you make, this is how you change your habits. This is how you develop good habits. Make it obvious. So tomorrow we're going to start reading the Bible together. And you go, yeah, I'm going to read the Bible, I'm going to read so much. No, you're going to choose one verse, and you're not going to get it on your phone, and you're not going to read it on an app, and you're not going to go and get it on Facebook, because what happens to you to Facebook? 14 people have liked my stuff. Stop being intrigued by people liking your pictures. Most of the likes on Facebook are posted while people are sitting on the toilet. You go and you have, a, you have your Bible highlighted somewhere and marked. So what you do, make it obvious, you put it next to your bed. Make it attractive. Go and get a scripture that encourages you. I'm the head, not the tail, I'm a butt. Oh, well, everyone reads that. Go and get the Jeremiah 29 scripture where God says, I have good plans for you. Because when you wake up and you know there's something life being spoken over you, you're going to do it. Make it easy. Get the Bible, do it the night before, go and find a verse. What's funny is while you're trying to find the verse, chances are you're going to read a bit of Scripture anyway. Make it satisfying. Share it with a friend. This is how you start developing good habits. So I'm going to start praying tomorrow, and every morning I'm going to pray. So you come with a prayer list. You're eventually praying for Afghanistan in your mind. You want to get... Pray for your children, pray for your wife every morning, but make it a habit. 
you set these unreasonable goals, you never ever step into what God has called you to because you never ever develop it as your custom, as your way to release it into your life. Choose smaller things. Uh, you can use the, the eating plan illustration. Stop saying, oh, I'm going to go to gym because then every day you don't go to gym, you're a failure. Make the statement, I'm an athlete. Athletes, what do they do? They eat properly and they go to gym, so that's your standard. So what am I? I'm a Christian. Christians read the word, they pray, and they spend time in his presence. So what I do, I grab one verse and I read it. And it can be the same verse every single day because the word of God is living and it is active and it can speak into my soul. And it can be the same verse and you can read it every day and God's going to speak some life into you. I'm a Christian, therefore I pray every day. I'm not just saying thank you for my food. If the only time my children spoke to me was when they thanked me for food, that is not a relationship. That's business. I have a relationship with God, therefore I speak to Him all the time. And I chat to Him. And it's not just my wish list. And it's not just my wants. It's my heartache. It's my pain. It's my vision. It's, Lord God, what are you wanting from me? Start off with two minutes tomorrow. See, the danger is when we do stuff, is we either go all in and burn out, or we all out and do nothing. As opposed to saying, actually tomorrow I'm going to introduce a new habit. Something is going to shift in my life. The way I speak about myself, the way I speak about my family, the time I spend with God. Please don't go, if you do 20 minutes of Bible study and 10 minutes of prayer, tomorrow make it 22 and 12 minutes that we grow. Perhaps you do nothing. And the reality is, and I don't want you to feel bad, I promise you 90% of the people in this room don't read the Bible in the week. I, I say that I don't include memes on Facebook, a cute scripture um, I've watched just too many people quote scripture that's not scripture because Facebook had it. The word of God is not takeaways. It's food that you open up at home and, pre and God prepares a meal for you. It's not takeaways. You sit with scripture and you open it up. And don't go to the middle and open it up. The Bible always seems to open up on Psalm 118 because that's the middle of the Bible. Go and open it. Go and read something. Go, change your habits. If you change your habits... You change, and you start growing into the person God is calling you to be. And God loves you as you are. He, he just, he's madly in love with you. We sang the song, he's madly in love with you just as you are. But he wants to see you grow into the likeness of Jesus. And Jesus, as his custom, would spend time with the Father. Jesus would often go away and spend time with the King. Don't burn yourself out in one week. Slowly develop good habits. Then it says, and the Lord said... It also says, for the Lord was with him. This is David. Point number three. You need to hear God and you need to be with God. You need to spend time with God. For you to step into your destiny, you need to be with him. And this is how you get to be with God. You spend time with his children and you spend time in his word. Point one, point two, all over again. It's to be in the presence of God. There's something. I love worshiping at home. I can worship in the car while I'm driving. I put a music loud enough that I can't hear my own voice. It's fantastic. But there's something different when I'm standing here with you guys and I'm worshiping. And there's this corporate anointing as we celebrate the goodness of our King. We say, it's the same as watching a rugby game at home or watching a rugby game in a stadium. At home, you might know everything that's going on on the screen, but at the stadium... You might not even know what's going on on the Sunday morning at some places in the meeting, but there's this excitement as our King is with us and we celebrate as His children. We cannot neglect this, but the whole plan is to be in His presence. I hear people say, oh, the presence of God was so beautiful in church. Really, what did you do with it? Hey? Well, the presence of God was there. If God is there, what are you saying to Him? What are you sharing with Him? What is He saying to you? David had developed a life that when... He got into the presence of God. He would worship him. He was a poet. He was this incredible writer. I don't think because he had this natural ability. But it's because he spent time in the presence of God. Your destiny will not be fulfilled if you don't spend time with our king. Basics. You sit in a pub every night, you'll eventually become an alcoholic. You spend time in the presence of God, eventually you're addicted to the Spirit of God. You make better decisions, better choices, better habits, better attitude. But for me, this is the kicker. David was 30 years old. If, I don't want to ask how many 30-year-olds there are. 
because then you're going to say, oh, well, I'm only 29, it gets weird then. For 15 years, for 15 years, David had waited. For 15 years, David had carried this thing in him that I will one day be king. For 15 years, this had sat with him. When you are 15 years old and you wait another 15 years, Scripture is saying it may take a lifetime for God to release you into what He's called you to, but if you're diligent and patient and you wait, God will do it. It might take your lifetime. It will be worth it. Because it says that then David ruled for 40 years. No matter what you've gone through, God has a future and a destiny for you. But we need to start living in this headspace that God has a timetable. In Galatians 4, it speaks about at the right time, God sent his son Jesus. At the right time. There's stuff that God's going to release over your life. There's finances, there's health, there's all sorts of stuff that God's going to release over your life at the right time. Not your timing, at the right time. Not at your preferred timing, not at the better, at the right time. Which means that your blessing and your, your provision can come at the wrong time. You have to change your habits. You cannot be financially irresponsible and expect God to bless you and somehow bail you out of your mess because he's going to then supply your needs and you're going to mess it up again. Prepare for what God is going to release you into. Well, I want to be in business one day. Be responsible with your finances. Oh, well, I want to be a manager one day. Be responsible with the way you deal with clients. Else you're going to end up in the same mess in five years from now as what you are now. But when you've developed these habits and you're a steward of your finances and you work with people in such a way that God can then release the blessing. I think there's something God waited, Galatians 4, God waited for the right time and at the appointed time, Jesus Christ was born. It's amazing because at the same time, Peter and John were there and John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, was born at the same time. And Herod had to be in authority and all these things had to be set up according to the plan of God. There's something that we need to learn about God's timing. God is working to a timetable, and God is very comfortable not giving you the details. God is all right not giving you all the details of what he's going to do. You see, well, God, God says, I know the plans I have for you, the good plans, the plans to make you prosper. You go, well, I'm not prospering yet because you're still in the process. I'd been saved about six months. <laughs> I was frustrated. Born again out of a crazy lifestyle, and I'm sitting in an amazing church, almost as good as this one. I'm sitting in this incredible church, and I'm frustrated because I'm not leading the church, and I'm not preaching, and I'm not doing anything, and I'm just frustrated, and it makes me a difficult person to lead, and my elders were challenging me, and I'm like, Ugh. And we were staying in Pretoria, and the church we went to was in Johannesburg, so we drive through, and the one, one Wednesday night we're driving through to prayer, I'm driving like an absolute maniac, and I'm weaving through traffic, and I'm frustrated, and you know, it, it's just, I'm being me at my best in the natural, and I get to church. Now this is my face, now you know, this is me happy, can you imagine when I'm not? And I get to church, and I go plonk in the chair, and my, it's just like a brat. And I sit there, and this wonderful guy in the church... Ndaba. He comes to me, he goes, hey brother, and I'm like, I'm not in the mood to speak to anyone, but I'm going to be polite, he's a leader in the church. Hello. He says to me, I want to share this with you. Great. And he sits in the seat in front of me and he leans back and he says, through faith and patience, Abraham inherited the promises of God. Tzak. He says, you see, through, through faith and patience. And he looked at me, he says, your faith is wobbling, but your patience is gone. I smiled. I don't think I really smiled. But I thought, I don't want to be patient. Doctors can have patience. God must do it now. And it's amazing, as I look back, if God had released me into anything more than looking after, actually I just stood at the door as a bouncer at that stage, because somebody was trying to attack the lead pastor. I wasn't totally against him getting the lead pastor, I just enjoyed being the bouncer. But if God had released me into any form of ministry then, I would have been an absolute disaster, because I wasn't carrying the weight of the Holy Spirit that I'm supposed to carry. 
Because you see, when you... Can I have two people that can run? Like, not yet, not yet. Even I love... Jeff, I've seen you, and you want to volunteer for the choir. And, 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 and Crispin, you've done the comrades. Did you panic there, Yuan? Don't worry, no. So what I want you to do, just I want you to run around to the back, but just, just to the back, and then make it back here. Okay. Jeff, it'll, I mean Jeff, you'll go that way around. Crispin, you'll go that way around. Now, Crispin, you're a top athlete. You've done the comrades. <laughs> and you've watched the comrades. <laughs> He's so fit, he ran it there and back. Okay. You may not miss a drop, please. Please don't miss. Jeff, go. Go. Crispin, go. Go, Crispin, go. Go. Go, Crispin. Go, Crispin, you're an athlete. Go. No, 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 no. Go, Crispin, go. Do they give you a lead medal for the... Thank you. Yeah, I'll go that way. <laughs> when you're empty and you just have yourself to play with and contend with, the run is fast and easy and of no significance. But when you carry the weight to the Holy Spirit, you walk differently, you function differently, but you're slower. You're slower. To run. When you're just full of yourself. You saw my vinti. <laughs> when you're carrying what the Holy Spirit has deposited in you, and you don't want to mess, you don't want to grieve, you don't want to offend, you go slower, but you go significantly deeper into His presence, carrying something that can sustain others. Drink it. <laughs> Those who are thirsty. I want to hand out something to you this morning. Can I please get the, the chosen few? And just start on one end. We need to have our goals set before us. Just if we can stand on one side, wow, well, no, if we can stand on one side and just work our way through. We'll just run around randomly and give to. If each family... Okay, make sure you've got one by the end of the meeting. Uh, preferably one for every family um, would be great. One per family and not four. It's not coloring in. This is not spur. You see, we need to establish our habits. We need to establish that you've got to wait. I love the scripture. Second service, mental note. We'll have the people fetch it in the front. Listen to what God says. He speaks in Habakkuk 2, verse 2 and 3. But these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Families, I want you I want you to write your family vision on there. Maybe there's a personal vision. Maybe it's financial breakthrough. Whatever direction you're heading into, wherever, any direction you feel. I've had magnets stuck on there. It took my fire starters three hours. You can stick it on your fridge. Maybe you've got a new fridge that only the sides are magnetic. If you can't do that, maybe your fridge is just plastic all over. Get some plastic. Stick it somewhere where it's obvious that you can see it every day. It's through faith and patience we'll inherit the promises of God. It's through the patience that God needs you to bear as fruit, to have as your nature, for us to see you step into your destiny. You write your vision on there. This is not name it, claim it, and frame it. This is just name it and frame it. 
You're right on there what you're trusting God to do for your life. And every single time you want to quit, every single time you want to back off, every single time you're thinking, I cannot do this, I cannot, that's the scripture we hang on to. But these things I plan won't happen right away. This is God saying, slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. What vision has God given you for your life? And I'm telling you, you may think it's slow. God is preparing you for more. You may think I'll never make it. God's saying, be patient, wait. He's saying, God, why am I slowing down? The more time I spend in your presence is because he's filling your cup up with his Holy Spirit so that you carry value and purpose, that you reach the destiny that he's called you to. Let's pray. Let's pray together. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've never left us and you've never abandoned us, you haven't forgotten about us. We thank you, Lord God, that there's visions and there's life that, is, that you have for your children, every single person, every single family sitting here this morning. There's a dream that God has over us, and we, we celebrate that, my King. So I speak over the families here this morning. Where sickness and disease has slowed us down. We speak life and life in abundance. Fire of God come. Our eternal king who knows only how to give his children good gifts. We speak a release this morning over your children. Where finances have become a burden and a focal point. I pray, Lord God, for supernatural provision and supernatural ability to outlast the waiting. I pray for the singles this morning, those that are not married yet. Lord, I pray that they will be faithful in waiting for the Mr. or Mrs. Wright that you have prepared for them. Lord, I speak life over relationships in Jesus' name. I speak over marriages in Jesus' name, that there'll be a new life released. I speak over energy levels, that as people wait faithfully and patiently, Lord, I pray, new life to be released. While eyes are closed this morning, and I'm trusting God is speaking to you and setting vision in your life, that you can write it on this little card, and you're going to stick it up, and every single day I will wait faithfully and patiently for God to release me into the destiny He's chosen. I pray that we'll be reminded of lifestyle changes that we need to make. But you're possibly sitting here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never made a commitment to follow Jesus. You see, it says that when I started, it said they were both of the same flesh and bone. You need to be part of this family, not of Lighthouse Church, but of the kingdom of God. You need to give your life to Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what religion you've dabbled in. It doesn't matter what you've gotten up to. The blood of Jesus washes away all our sins and our past when we give our lives to Jesus. This morning, if that is you, most of the people in the room have given their lives to Jesus at some time. And when you've given it once, He takes it and He makes it beautiful. This is not so you can have a better life, but that you can have purpose. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand, please. I'm just going to give it a few seconds. I don't see any hands going up. So I pray this over the children of God. May we walk in the destiny that God has chosen. May we live a lifestyle that represents our family, our kingdom, and our king well. We submit to you, our Lord, and I pray, King Jesus, that nothing and no time and no situation will deter us and distract us from filling the mandate on our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.